now is not the time for my laptop to go slow. And we are in. Cool. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the first of this year of the CBF Lightning Talks. We're going to be running these quarterly, or if we have popular demand, maybe we run them more often. My name is Tanya Powell. I am the co-CTO of Coding Black Females. And tonight I will be your host. We have some amazing speakers with us tonight. We have five amazing ladies who were talking about various different parts of technology, tech journeys, tech deep dives, incredible topics. You're going to love this. And if they inspire you, and if you're feeling brave enough, maybe you will sign up for our next lightning talk. And while we're doing them, I'll find out what date it is. I can't remember right now off the top of my head, but we do have the next one in the diary already. So hopefully these amazing people will inspire you and you'll sign up for the next round of lightning talks which I think oh, I'll find out let me not give me not make things up I'll find out the date while the talks are happening and just a few updates from coding black females we have a lot going on behind the scenes we actually have a very special announcement coming out in the next couple of weeks so please keep an eye out on our social medias if you haven't signed up to our newsletter already be sure to sign up for it because we've got a very special announcement. And finally, today's actually the official fifth birthday of Coding Black Females. Today, 10-5. What we officially celebrating today, our official celebrations will be next month. So make sure you are available. And again, I'll find out the date for that because I can't remember right now, but it will be in person. It will be a vibe. We have a true celebrations next month for the fifth anniversary, the fifth birthday of Coding Black Females. And on that now, I'm going to stop talking and ask a quick question. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Um, sorry, on, please hype it up. Give her a big virtual round of applause while I share my screen. And first up, we have the incredible Asia, and you have got 10 minutes. Over to you. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that amazing introduction, first of all. And also, thanks everyone who made it today. Um, so, yeah, my name's Asia. Um, I'm going to talk doing? about how I went from a oh. tech new... Wait, did someone speak or am I talking? Okay, okay. I'm going to talk about how I went from a tech newbie to an award-winning engineer in less than 12 months. So today I'm going to cover my journey, um, mindset, why network is important and, re and resources for both mindset and anyone who wants to get into software engineering or software development. Um, but yeah, so just to kick off about my journey I actually transitioned into tech from a non-technical background um, in January 2021. Um, the reason I decided to transition into technology was because I seen you know that you can evolve the technology it's ever evolving and I can grow as a person and it was something that I've never did before and um, especially the fact that I chose to learn to code because tech is a broad word right um, but I specifically chose shows at the time software development um, and yeah and taking that challenge on I just wanted to grow like outside my comfort zone and within 12 months I've actually participated in multiple boot camps I've done multiple public speaking talks for and to inspire so many amazing women to also get into any part of technology and not just that I've been nominated for multiple awards and I also won a Globant award out of over 68,000 nominees worldwide so it just goes to show that no matter who you are where you come from and like just your religion or gender you can actually achieve like anything that you put your mindset to and I am a massive um believe her when it comes to mindset so yeah on to the next slide <laughs> oh no like right uh, the next slide no no like right so slide eight yeah sorry okay back back one sorry apologies yeah perfect um so fixed um okay so 
what I want to talk about when it comes to mindset is the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. It's super important, especially within the technology industry, to have um, a growth mindset. And what I mean by this is a fixed mindset is, you know, saying things like, I can't do it. I can't change. I give up. I avoid what's best for me. Whereas a growth mindset is, I can do it. Challenge is great. When I'm frustrated, I persevere. I embrace things and, you know, I will network and I won't let my pride or ego get in the way. That is a growth mindset. And you need to believe in yourself, especially when you come out your comfort zone. You need to believe that you can develop that talent. You can develop abilities. So when I chose to be a software engineer, even though I did not come from a technical background, I don't hold a degree, like, um, let alone come from like a computer science or mathematical background, I had to believe in myself and also surround myself with people who were um, growing and also believe in themselves too, because then it would allow me on my hardest days to overcome obstacles. Because at the end of the day, nothing is easy whatsoever, especially things that you want, like goals that you set for yourself. You need that growth mindset to know that, okay, I'm going to face obstacles. But with the growth mindset, I know there's always a solution. You know, like I always say, where there's a will, there's a way. Like there is a solution and there is always light at the end of every dark tunnel. And when it comes to learning something that you've never learned before and stepping outside your comfort zone, you know, people might not believe in your, you. Sometimes you might doubt yourself and that's where you have to just, you know, implement that growth mindset. And that's where success will come in and discipline and you will con- obviously end up having control over your life, which is so important. Whereas a fixed mindset will just up let you plateau and you will never grow and you know I as I said it's just so important to keep that mindset that you can persevere that you will get to where you want to be to focus on the daily goals but yeah on to the next slide perfect so one thing and an advice I'll always give to everybody who asks me um how to get into tech or software engineering or how to achieve anything is the first thing is network Now, the power of networking is crazy. And what I mean by this is, say that you aspire to be a software engineer like I did myself. The first thing I did was I found a platform, LinkedIn, and I literally just typed software engineer and found every single person who like I could reach that was a software engineer. And I just messaged them. And soon enough, like at least a handful of people were willing to mentor me and help me and take time out their day to get me to where I am today. And I've achieved everything that I've achieved today and also the surroundings that I'm around, the people I'm around, all thanks to networking. You are also the product that you surround yourself by. So surround yourself with people who are growing, people who obviously want to become better, 1% better every single day, whether it's emotionally, spiritually, financially, um, physically, mentally, it doesn't matter. As long as they're growing every single day they want to become better every single day surround yourself with them because you're going to need to lean on them some days when you know you feel down or you you need another oomph of like self-belief right um and your network is also your network like where you'll be in five years who you'll be in in five years it's like the five people you hang around with is exactly who you'll be in five years time so for me um, in my journey, I've made sure to surround myself with like-minded people and women and empowering women. Um, and that's what's got me to where I am now. And now I'm launching my own blockchain startup. And without my network, I wouldn't, again, be where I am today. So network is very important. Network, network, network. And don't ever feel ashamed. It's, it's amazing and it's fun. So yeah, next slide. So just um, like, over the next couple of slides, I'm just going to talk about resources. Um, I know when it comes to, say, once again, software engineering or software development, um, a lot of us kind of find it hard, like, okay, where's the best resources for this? And I've narrowed down like a handful of resources that work really well for me, but also don't overwhelm yourself with the amount of information that each resource will provide. And what I mean by that is, you know, pick one resource. For example, if you pick a YouTube channel and I've given an example, Tech with Tim, just go by 10 minutes a day, then 20 minutes a day, then 30 minutes a day. 
splitting things down to smaller goals, you're more likely to achieve the bigger goal, which is complete completing that boot camp, right? Or completing that YouTube channel. And um, there's also so many other boot camps provided by Code and Black Females, Code First Girls and Black Girls in Tech that can help you not only learn obviously software engineering, but also help you with um CV and technical interviews and how to get a job after. And um, um, I was lucky that I was actually helped with Code and, from Code and Black Females and Code First Girls um, in regards to um, where I am today and my engineering role now. I actually start as an engineer next week with NatWest, so I'm very happy for that. And, you know, a lot of a lot, a lot lot of women out there can also have the same journey if they focus on the right resources and small goals when it comes to resources. And just lastly, I want to touch upon and close up on mindset once again. So, yeah, the next slide. Mindset is really important. Um, you are honestly who you are in this world. You're either somebody or nobody. So choose to um, live each day becoming, you know, the best version of yourself. And when it comes to mindset, for me, the best resources um, that I found was TED Talks, my Mindset Podcasts and Reading Self-Development Books. I will send over to Code and Black Females all the resources in a PDF for anyone who is interested in that and kind of just wants that help when it comes to like mental elevation. And especially on your um, hardest days, it can really help you overcome certain obstacles by just listening to the right TED Talk or the right Mindset Podcast because you're not then blurred with the negativity. So just to wrap up, as I said, um, if me, myself, you know, a person who comes from so many obstacles in my background can go from self-taught to an award-winning engineer in 12 months, then so many amazing women and people from underrepresented backgrounds out there can too with the right help. And I'm happy to help. And there's so many people out there that will, hence why networking is important. So I hope you enjoyed my lightning talk and yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so a big virtual round of applause, please, everyone. That was amazing. We have got a question in the chat for you. So we've got five minutes for questions. If anyone's got any questions, pop them in the chat now. Okay. So Jessica says, love hearing about your journey. Did you do you ever find that you need to reset your thoughts to get back to that growth mindset way of thinking? That what mindset? growth mindset way of thinking yes 100 percent. I feel like even with myself it's a it's a daily battle but it's um the way I reset my thoughts is through meditation or journaling um and it helps me kind of if my mind is so cluttered um and I'm so you know there's a million things going on in my mind or I just know that there's a million resources I need to learn all at once um I will declutter by just taking time away from anything that's technology. So I will either read a book, meditate for 20 minutes. And um, I am Muslim, so I do pray, um, which a lot gives me like five to 10 minutes, like just alone away from everything. And I journal and journaling every single day has helped me like reset my mind, but also put things into place. I also use an organization board called Trello. And that also, once again, helps me break down my like morning routine my daily goals my evening routine so whenever I feel like I'm a bit all over the place and I really don't want to focus on the fixed mindset and I want to focus on the growth mindset I'll just click on Trello and I'll see do you know what what on here have I put in that's going to help me feel a bit better for example meditation so I will just do that and check it off so I hope that answers your question question on how to like reset and um and don't dwell on it we're all human we will all hit brick walls every day and we all, we all feel like every single day we might face an obstacle but it's like the thought like how you think about that um as I said I will add resources later that help you replace that feeling of feeling stuck um so yeah we have another question do you have examples where networking has helped you in your journey yeah um so thanks to networking um, so I networked with a guy called Ola, who was a soft, he's a software engineer at Sky. Thanks to him, I got the Sky Software Engineering Academy in January 2021, which is my start, start of my tech journey. Another networking was I tweeted random people on Twitter um, if they help fund um, women's startups. And I actually got put on the, one of the top UK um, startups, um, uh, accelerator programs, which now not only funds my startup, 
but also helped me over a six month period to build and put me with all the right connections. And like that just shows the importance of networking. Furthermore, over summer, um, just from messaging people on LinkedIn and being around the right people um, and networking and keeping the right friends through the Sky Software Engineering Programme, like for example, Amber, who will be speaking soon and Jesse, they introduced me to Code First Girls. And thanks to that introduction, I was able to do a nano degree, which has now um, gave me my first software engineering role, as I explained earlier, start next week. So without that, the power of networking, I definitely wouldn't be where I am today. So. No, I was muted. How do you find, how did you overcome imposter syndrome? Do you, did you, or do you suffer from it? Um, so I, I, I don't believe in imposter syndrome. What I believe is in feelings and feelings are temporary, temporary, just like thoughts. So over time with journaling and meditation and prayer, I, I taught myself how to replace a sad feeling with a more, I'll embrace that situation feeling. Um, and now, you know, I've, as I said, if we had time, you know, I could list all the obstacles that I've been through, which would be crazy. I mean, Amber and Jesse can vouch for my obstacles. And yet I still stand here today and achieve so much because instead of feeling sad and anger or even sometimes hatred towards a situation I couldn't control, I wouldn't focus on that. I would, my brain would replace straight away, focus on what I can control, replace that feeling with like a solution feeling, like I'll embrace the situation. So definitely, if, as I said, it comes to a growth mindset and that takes time. Every day I'm still learning and it takes months and years, but don't beat yourself up as long as you try and grow your mindset every single day. Eventually, imposter syndrome won't exist and you'll just accept that feelings are literally temporary. You can cry today and laugh tomorrow, you know? And two more questions. One of those from me. The first one is, can you tell us a bit about your experience with the CFG Nano degree? Um, um, the CFG Nano degree. Um, as I said, thanks to the Code First Girls Nano degree, um, it enabled me to obviously get my first engineering job at a leading bank in the UK. Um, in regards to my experience, um, I would say uh, it was great. But of course, you know, with every greatness comes struggle and the struggles where I wasn't from a mathematical background. And, um, you know, there were sometimes where learning algorithms and data structures, I would struggle with with that. However, I, as I said, I did overcome all my obstacles. So I would say definitely apply for the nano degree if you're trying to obviously um, get into software engineering quicker, I guess. But just know it will be an intense course. It is like doing a computer science degree in 15 weeks um, and be prepared to you know um, learn so much but it will be great and you will start at you know some leading companies and now they have over 50 amazing partners and um, but as I said prior um, prior uh, applying make sure you study like the basics of mathematics and algebra especially and um, just for the second half of the nano degree so yeah and my question is how can we keep in touch with you um, I have a Twitter account, which is mostly for tech. So I can send you my Twitter account, which I write in the chat. And I also have LinkedIn, which is just my name, as you should be. Um, I'll just write that for everyone. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm trying to do it now. Okay. I've just sent my... Sorry, guys. I'm on my phone. So this is like super... Okay, perfect. There's my Twitter. A big, massive, virtual round of applause for you one more time. You kicked thank off. You. That was really hard. You set the tone. We thank you. Thank you so much. Next up, we have the awesome Danny. Danny, are you ready? <laughs> no, but hey, let's go. Uh, can you just push through it anyway? Just get on with it? Thank you. I will. One minute. Um, well, You're going to be amazing. You're going to be incredible. It's Don't forget, we are your cheerleaders. We are here for you. Is, it's never the actual, well, it's the talk, but it's the tech. Like, it's the Zoom stuff. I hate Zoom. Um, this is why I asked you to come early because I can't use Zoom. And also, when Asia was like, the next slide to the right, I was like, I don't know my left or right. This is going to be interesting. Oh, gosh. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, you have got 10 minutes. Over to you. 
Cool, great. Thank you. And thank you, Asia. That that was an amazing talk. And I would say as well, like what you said about networking is so important because I think I actually got my first talking event via Coding Black Females. And um, I've been able to do a lot of talks via Coding Black Females and um, as well as other um, networking groups. So I would definitely agree with that networking is seriously important. Um, so my talk, um, if you've seen one of these before, you will figure out that I'm very obsessed with time, which is hilarious because I'm always late. Um, but this talk is about timing when it comes to JavaScript, the browser, and trying to build a drum machine. So, as you know, my name's Danny, and I'm a software developer in fintech. And I've switched careers maybe twice already. I think this is going to be my final one. Um, but I am really, really interested in security and data privacy. But I would say my first love has always been music. And how I got into talking was via a method called Petra Kutcher. And it's a way of um, talking visually. And so this is how this talk is going to be done. So before I worked in tech, I was a teacher. And then I figured that I didn't really like kids, especially ones that are six foot four and half six foot four when I'm not. Um, and I remember seeing a Google Doodle um, of a music sequencer. And I thought, Do you know what? I really love music and I'm a drummer. So let's see if I could actually build one. And when I was looking at this music sequencer, it's, it's basically what you call a step sequencer. So you've got all of these vertical lines and you count them as a step. And what happens is something in the background is looping through each of these steps. And if one of these tabs is clicked, somewhere in the background, something says, I want to be played. And so I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how could I actually turn that or how would I actually build that? This music sequencer was made in honor of someone called Oscar Finchinger. And I was thinking, I quite like drums. And one of my favorite drummers is the wife of Carlos Santana. So I'll do a drum version. And so breaking it down and trying to simplify it. I started to think about the things I discovered when looking at that Google Doodle, the things I thought would be important um, when I built a drum step sequencer and how I'd actually put this into place. So I've said it several times already, it's a step sequencer. There is something in the background looping through steps and if a tab is clicked on, it will play it and then it will wait for a bit and then it will go to the next one and then go to the next one. Um, and this sequencer is gonna be very, very important because something connected to the step sequencer is going to be the tempo or what you guys will know as the beats per minute. So the time in between each step. It's gotta be interactive, so when somebody clicks on one of the tabs for a specific instrument, they want that tab to play that sound at a certain moment of time. And then I was also thinking, hey, well, if somebody's made this sound or this drum beat, they probably are going to want to share it. So how am I going to build this thing so that they can share it? But that one was a bit of a background one, to be honest. So. If I'm thinking steps and sequences, naturally I was thinking arrays. And because it's gonna be either like a two by two array or a four by four array, it's gonna to need to be nested um, arrays. And every tap on the screen 
will translate to every value or element in this nested array going from true to false or back again. Then we have the sequencer bit or we have the looping bit. So it's a drum machine. And if you've ever worked with musicians, they are pretty pedantic when it comes to time, apart from guitarists that have a habit of following bassists and they are not real musicians. Um, but I would need a way to be able to step through everything and the time needs to be consistent. Because if you remember, I said, what if they wanted to be able to record it or share it? And the worst thing to happen for a user would be if they recorded this sound and then they wanted to play it to, I don't know, a Jay-Z track or something, and then their drum beat kind of went out of time with this track they're playing along to. If that was a payable product, the users would not be happy at all. So given that I wanted this to be interactive, I wanted it to be very, very shareable, and I wanted to build it pretty quickly. I went for doing a web app. So that would be JavaScript in the browser. And I found that JavaScript used or could be used alongside something called Web Audio API. And that was this whole API that had things to do with timing, step sequences, playing, pause, record, and all of that things that I really wanted. And it was an asynchronous API, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, but one of the main features of this Web Audio API is it had a set timeout function. And what that meant is I could, or the user, when they tapped on something or they tapped on one of the arrays or one of the tabs, then there would be a function that would say, wait a second or wait the given time interval and then play it. And that was really important. So what I had in the end was something that more or less looked like this. So this whole app would see which part of the nested array had been turned from true to false or back again, and it would play it. Then the step timeout would wait a given amount of time, which would be set by the BPM. Then it would look again and say, which parts of these array is true or false, play that. And it would keep going on like that. And that's how the loop or the step sequence was set up. And so being me, I decided to share it with some friends, some as being musicians and some not. And I got a range of responses back. So some were saying, yeah, it's great. I don't really think they actually used it to be honest. Um, and then some were saying, Danny, the timing's a bit dodgy on this or things don't really seem to sync up. And I was like, why? Could you give me a bit more feedback? Could you be a bit more specific? And then it would say things like, well, every time I kind of try and resize the browser or like a pop-up comes, the thing goes out of sync. And I initially was like, you're an idiot. But then I actually did try what they were talking about. And they were actually right. And what that came down to was basically JavaScript and the browser and how the two things act. So JavaScript is what you call a single threaded um, language. So it does one thing at a time. So it's synchronous. But something like Web Audio API is what you call asynchronous. And that's like with the method um, set timeout. So what it will do is it will say, OK, I've got this, this function coming in. Um, I am going to wait for the response from it rather than just carrying on step by step by step. And a better way to actually visualize that rather than just giving you two words would be to show you. So let's say I had my code or my pseudo code and it was like, I've got function one, I've got function two, I've got function three. When JavaScript looks at it, JavaScript is gonna to wanna to put that on what you call the call stack. And the call stack is also known as the execution stack. So if I called function one first, and then I call function two second, function one goes on the call stack, and then function two goes on the call stack. But 
the call stack is what we call um, last in, first out. So until function two completes and is popped off the call stack, function one remains on the call stack. So you get function one in, then function two in, then function two pops off and then function one pops off. But then you're probably saying, but what about the whole asynchronous part? Well, this is where the API stack comes in. So JavaScript is gonna know somehow whether it's an asynchronous method or synchronous method. And what it will do is it will say, function one comes in, that's a synchronous method. Function two comes in, that's an asynchronous one. And that's gonna be something to do with the browser, like resizing the browser on an event listener. And then function one, function two comes in. What it will do is it will immediately send the event listener to the API stack. So then all you're left with is function one and function two on the execution stack. So what will happen is everything on the execution stack has to be dealt with, and then it will deal with the API stack. So when the main stack or the execution stack or the call stack, I do not know why they name it so many things, is empty, then the web browser will deal with the API stack. It will put it in the callback queue. So if there's more than one, it can deal with it in that way. And then that's when everything is finished. So you're probably thinking, how does that actually relate to this drum sequencer? Remember how I said that web audio API uses the set timeout function and the set timeout function is an asynchronous method just like any event listener is a synchronous method. What will happen is I could tap on the screen and do things on the screen, but those aren't necessarily going to be done in order. And some we have it, one minute left. Oh, crap. Uh, some of it's going to be done um, um, immediately. Some of it is going to be done by the call stack. So how is this fixed? Well, fixing it is basically saying, rather than look at things step by step, look at it in terms of a stream. So what you can do is say, I'm not just gonna do um, every single look at every single BPM. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, look at everything that is on there in the BPM or within that, that, that time segment, then look at everything in the next time segment and so on and so on. And that is a way to get around this um, API callback methods and things like that. It's not the best way, but it is a solution. So what that also told me from doing all of this was a change in mindset. It's not just about JavaScript and, and making things work in JavaScript. It's also knowing how JavaScript in, interacts with the environment it is working in. And so I got my drum sequencer called Kiki and Lola. And it may be a basic project, but I've used it to learn about a lot of things like authentication and deploying via AWS as well. Thank you for listening to my talk. That was amazing. Cool. Can I say one other thing? So I'll say I am really, really into um, people giving technical talks. So I'm also running a thing via Coding Black Females to coach people to do technical talks. The first version of that is happening now. And um, hopefully, Tanya, there'll be more in the future. So if anyone is interested in doing technical talks and wants help with that, um, <laughs> there should be more sessions in the future as well to encourage you or coach you or help you with that. Well, I think we're gonna need it because we're gonna have more lightning talks, right? And everyone here in attendance is gonna give a lightning talk at some point yes okay Elle's right next time it's happening l you're the first one up thanks that was really <laughs> that was that was strong that was strong that's a strong reaction the reaction we need we have five minutes for questions for danny does anyone have any questions you can unmute and ask or you can put them in the chat i have a quick question while everyone's typing where can we play with the drum kit? Oh, I'll put it in. It's like uzel.com. 
and you can also I got the recording stuff working as well so you can also record and send um actually let me see wait a minute let me let me ah where am I I cannot use my computer um sorry about that uh one minute so if I stop sharing and then I get out of this thing and then I go to the web browser. You can tell that I'm a fair programmer. Um, <laughs> let's see, so we've got uzel.com. Okay, so live demos are usually cursed, but let's have a go, so. Recording. You can like pause it and then you can replay it. Or you can pause it and you can stop it and then. So a lightning talk and a live demo. <laughs> Just like up in the bar today, aren't you, Danny? I'm joking. We love it. I think you get extra round of applause just for that live demo. I think you broke a curse as well. Live demos always go on, always. I think that is the first live demo that has ever, ever actually worked because usually it's like, it just, it just messes up, but yeah. That's great. I think we all have fun tonight playing with your app. You might get a lot of traffic. That's what I'm trying to say. You might get a lot of traffic tonight. We have, <laughs> we have two questions for you. The first one is, what advice would you give to juniors who want to do a technical talk but don't feel confident enough? Choose a project you've worked on. Um, and I say that all the time because you've worked on that project, you've built that project, and you would have learned things that other people will want to know about. And that's like, this, this was actually one of my, this was actually my first project. Um, when going into tech and then so what happened was um, by learning about the different parts of JavaScript and stuff like that um, that was a something I could talk about and also something I could talk about at interviews as well so it's it's a case of whatever project you're working on if there's anything you are unsure of there's going to be a million other people that are unsure of it as well so that's that's the first thing you talk about your experiences building an application or a tool or anything you you want to design. So we have one more question. How about adding voice? Any plans to add voice recording? Jesus. Um, I don't know. I will, you know, I will, I will take that under advisement. I, I never actually thought about um, adding voice recording, um, but yeah, um, why not? Where can we put in our feature requests for your app? I'm busy. Is it open source? Can we just open an issue and get have? Sure, I could just make it open source. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah, why not? I will make it open source. Um, yeah, it can be like a CBF project. Yeah. That would be amazing. It could be the first CBF open source project. Lightning yeah, talks, yeah. magic happens. Thank you, Danny. Another virtual round of applause. That was incredible, inspiring. I'm going to be tinkering on some stuff tonight. Thanks to that. <laughs> Amber, 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 Amber. Hello. You're next. Are you I'm ready? So excited. Yeah, 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 I'm ready. You have 10 minutes over to you. Thank you. So hi, everyone. So today I'll be speaking about teaching people how to code as a tech newbie. Oops. OK, cool. So, hey, my name is Amber Shand. I'm currently working as a junior software soft engineer at Bank. I currently run a blog at ambershand.co.uk. 
And I also create technical content on a platform that I built called Code Her Journey. And I actually don't come from a traditional background. I come from an economics and accounting degree. And I've created and led the introduction to Python course of Coding Black Females, which was sponsored by Brandwatch. And also I've previously, I've previously taught the web development and Python course for Code First Girls. And this was all done before I even landed my first role in tech. <laughs> so I wanted to just to talk briefly about the benefits of teaching. Like a few just to say is like, it's very rewarding when you're empowering other people when they're starting out on their journey, learning how to code. It makes your CV stand out, especially like if you're someone like me who comes from a non-technical background. And it also gives you the confidence when you're able to answer questions. It makes you feel like, okay, maybe I do know what's going on here. And it's a great way to develop on your communication skills, along with so many other skills that you, um, that you gain when you're teaching. So here are five tips for those who want to teach others how to code. If you're thinking about it, or maybe we'll be doing it soon. Here are my top five tips for you. So first of all, hopefully have some other instructors with you, but if you do, just set up a call with them just so you can delegate the lessons. When I first was teaching, I could not have taught the JavaScript portion at all. So I, I made sure to set up that call and say, hey, like I can only really teach the HTML and CSS sections. And it was great because the instructors are saying, good, because we can't do that, but we can teach the JavaScript part. So that was really, really great for me. And uh, it just gets that all out of the way. So you communicate that off the bat, right? Second tip is to prepare, prepare, prepare. So when I was first starting out, because I hadn't even landed in my role and I felt like, I'm not gonna lie, I, I was, I felt extremely unqualified. And when I feel that way and I feel out of control, I think, how can I control the situation? I can control it by preparing profusely. So before the lessons, I would literally go through what we'd be teaching. I watch tutorials on it. I would write down notes to just make sure that I'm explaining it in the best way possible. So yeah, preparing definitely made a huge, huge difference. Um, and also one of the biggest fears I had is what do I do if someone asks me a question and I'm not sure how to answer it? My go-to phrase was, so if someone asked a question, I would always say like, and I didn't know the answer, I would say, oh, does someone else wanna take this? Or because like, um, no one actually knows all these things off the top of their heads, right? I would say, oh, that's a great question. Let's Google it together and let's come to the answer, like all together as a team, because at the end of the day, software developers are Googling all the time anyway. So I just want to make it clear that there's no, pressure to have all these things memorized because we all google all the time anyway and also always ask for feedback from students and make adjustments i was literally when i first was sharing my screen i was just so excited i was just like just bursting with energy and because i was bursting with energy it meant that i was speaking super fast kind of like how i am now and i was kind of like whizzing through the content and i was very very grateful that someone said hey can you like slow down and that was great because it meant that, oh, whoops, sorry. I'm just so excited right now. Okay, I'll slow down. Is this a good pace for everyone? And then like, the next week when I was teaching again, I said, just let you know, like I am gonna be slower this time. I know last time was a bit fast, but I wanna make sure that this is a great pace for everyone because I want the experience to be amazing, right? And also please just be kind to yourself throughout. Teaching is definitely something that's very challenging and uh, it's definitely, it can be out of your comfort zone. So rather than that harsh critic that's getting the best of you, just try to get, give yourself some perspective and say, look, I'm just, I'm trying something new and I'm proud of myself for that. So I think I spoke, I went through this quite quickly, but thank you so much for listening and um, let's connect. Tanya, how long was that? <laughs> You were amazing, and that's what matters, is you were amazing. And you weren't going fast, you didn't whiz for it. You were incredible. Thank you. You were wonderful. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone's just showing you love in the chat. Can we come <laughs> off mute? Can we come yeah, off absolutely. mute now? Absolutely. Okay, so, yeah, I want to know, like, what was really your struggles, like, just knowing that, you had to teach and knowing that you really had to come in from a perspective of a newbie like how did you really like fight that to be really too technical 
So I think that there's actually a power in being a newbie because sometimes when you're a bit too technical, you think certain things are obvious and you won't actually explain it to a person that doesn't necessarily have this background. So I can definitely, you can definitely use it as your power as well. But again, like definitely come and prepared. And I would sometimes watch tutorials and see how they would explain it. Look at the content, see how they explain it and then come up with my own way of explaining it. And if I felt like I butchered something, I would say, okay, honey, here's a resource that you can look into <laughs> that will definitely do like this better justice sometime. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great experience, especially if you're a newbie. I think that you should definitely use that in your power, especially because there's other people who will, or hopefully, depending on who you volunteer to teach with, but um, there'll be other people to support you as well. I hope that answers your question. You're great. No, don't doubt yourself at all, Amber. You're great. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. We have a question. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you learn anything new from teaching? Oh, so, so much. I learned so much. Like, um, I feel like I learned a lot about myself, especially because I was definitely pushing myself up the comfort zone. First time I did it was in the pandemic. And uh, you learn a lot about, you know, when someone asks you a question, it really like, makes you question, how well do I understand this myself? And I had a really, I, it was a great experience when I was able to answer a question like, okay, I'm actually quite confident with arrays. And I actually know what I'm talking about. And I'm actually able to, if someone questions something and says they're not sure why it's this, I'm actually able to explain this. So I think it was great for my imposter syndrome at the time thinking, oh, I'm not good enough. But then I'm able to answer these technical questions, which is why I love teaching in Python. <laughs> I don't think I'll go back to web development anytime soon. <laughs> But yeah, I definitely had to do a lot of research into like when you're explaining it so I could just do it justice. So I definitely learned a lot through that as well. <laughs> Play JavaScript over Python. I, I normally do code in JavaScript, but to teach it sometimes. <laughs> I especially hate you on CSS because when there's a bug, I'm like, it could be anything. But in Python, I can just, I would just be like, oh, it's here. You know, I have to go through all the files with the web development stuff. <laughs> um teaching with my day job so I actually haven't taught that much since working and um, it's because I don't want to overcommit so that's a question that <laughs> I really hate overcommitting so I said that I do want to teach again but I don't want to like uh you know not do it justice essentially so I can't necessarily answer that question for now unfortunately <laughs> it's good but it does take us away I completely agree with you, Jessica. If you go for the struggle of C++, C Sharp, Java, and then come to JavaScript, you're like, I could do anything? What? And you just accept it? It's like, cool, I'm going to stick with you for a while. I like typed languages. I don't know. I think like it makes, it makes a lot of sense. But it depends. It depends. I'm, I'm looking to learn TypeScript soon as well. Cool. You are so funny. Why is the chat being so funny right now? <laughs> this is the thing, right? Everyone in the replay through is going to miss out on the chat and we're not going to share it. You have to be here in person. Yeah. To know what's happening in the chat? The Come to the next. Come to the me. next one. Exactly. <laughs> we're not going to share the chat. You have to be here. It's like Vegas, right? Exactly. <laughs> the chat is just going off and I'm so <laughs> amused. Jessica is hilarious. Jessica, why are you a comedian? <laughs> I think Jessica forgets that because she's got a camera on. All her facial expressions are on YouTube as well. Camera suddenly goes off. <laughs> Can we get another round of applause for Amber, please? Another virtual round of applause. You are oh, thank amazing. You. Thank you so you much. You are everyone. amazing. Very inspiring. Teaching before getting your first job. I, I don't yeah. know how I had the confidence. I actually think about this a lot. <laughs> I don't, know. I don't know where that came from I was writing a blog post on this and I was like how did I think that I was qualified to do this? you had the audacity to just I had, try exactly I had the and, and you did it and you did it and, and did you it. that's what's even right. better you killed it like oh you yeah hit it out the park did you go to a boot camp I wanted to ask you that Amber um in the end 
No, I actually did a part-time kind of deal with Sky getting the tech scheme. So the first week was intensive, it was nine to five. And then after that, it was like um, every Thursday from like six to eight. And I landed my role, like maybe, it was actually after the intensive week. That's when I landed my role and I was going to, I was starting in September. So yeah, I didn't actually even take a boot camp. And when I was teaching, I literally, I had just graduated from university and I was doing my little, you know, CSS and HTML like courses. And I was definitely stuck in tutorial hell. And I thought that, do you remember how I said I, um, I organized a meeting with all the instructors? It was because if they said they couldn't have taught JavaScript, I was going to use that as motivation just to, okay, we're gonna give me motivation to learn JavaScript so I can teach it. So I just needed to know like how much effort I'm gonna have to do outside to make sure that I can, t- I can teach the basics. So yeah. Thank you so much, Amber. Self-belief is everything. Self-belief yeah. is everything. Yeah, absolutely everything. it's powerful. But yeah, do reach out if you're considering teaching. Like Code First Girls are always looking for new instructors. So definitely apply for that. And if you're <laughs> so is Coding Black Females. And so is Coding Black Females. Send me the link. <laughs> Send me the link, Tanya. I'm going to add it to my blog post for people to sign up as an instructor. Will do. I'll put it in good. the chat at some point. Okay, good. Thanks. We have lost our next speaker. Michelle, if you're still out there, please send me a message. I think... Um, I'll- I'm uh, yeah I'm the Michelle on your list I believe (laughs) yes I go by many names you you logged in earlier as a different name yes oh my gosh confused me I was gonna send you a little motivational message to get you amped up okay yeah I guess um, we're gonna do it live in person are you oh god am I next so you're next are you ready Oh my god okay let me screen share and just get this over and done with i'm sure it will be fine like all you are gonna be bad. incredible so far right um cool can you see my screen we can see your screen you have 10 minutes can you see my don't little thing in the bob too you can see it don't forget deep breaths you're gonna be amazing <sighs> okay well let's do this uh so yeah hi everyone um uh, my name is l i'm a front-end developer who recently took part in a course to learn about crypto and blockchain development with asia from earlier actually so it's nice to see you here too uh yeah so welcome to my talk uh sis what's the tea on nfts it would be great if i can improve your understanding about this technology just a little bit but it would be amazing if i can make you laugh while doing so so let's jump straight into it Right, so talk about NFTs have been basically everywhere, Um, and it's really hard to ignore, especially when you see the sort of money involved in this space. But what is an NFT? Um, How do you buy one, and what makes them so special? Well, to get to that, I'd like to break down the word itself, NFT, or non-fungible token. The important bit here is the word fungible. Fungibility is actually an economics term that describes any good that is interchangeable and indistinguishable. For example, the £10 in my pocket is the same as the £10 in your pocket. If we exchange with each other, we still have £10 at the end of the day. My one apple, my, my one share in Apple is the same as what your one share in Apple. So naturally, something that's non-fungible is not any of this. It's unique. It's a one-in-a-kind sort of a- item that is not interchangeable. Examples of this would be Pokemon cards, the first ever tweet, or the Mona Lisa itself. Simply, an NFT is a unique token. So even though NFTs are typically represented as images, NFTs can be songs, they can be video game items, they can even be real life things. But for simplicity's sake, let's imagine that our NFT is a digital artwork. What happens when you buy one? Okay, so the story starts like this. You go to somewhere like OpenSea, which is a market like eBay for listing and selling NFTs. You spot one called Baddie with the Hoop Earring going for about 0.1 Ethereum, which is equivalent to about 450 pounds today, and you want to buy it. So it's not unlike you buying something from Amazon, except what happens is your money, which is actually cryptocurrency Ethereum, goes from your digital wallet to something called a smart contract, but we can try and understand that sort of like a vending machine. 
So you insert your money into the vending machine and it gives you a receipt that shows that you are now, congratulations, the owner of Baddie with a hoop earring. It then sends your money off to the artist who made that work and the platform listing it and other parties involved. Okay, um, I've got a receipt, now what? Okay, so we've all been there, right? We bought those jeans that looked great in the store. We take them home. We're having second thoughts. We're going to return this. Where's the receipt? Okay, so it's clearly important to keep this information of you being the, or the owner somewhere safe and secure so you can come back to it later. The question is, how do we go about recording this information of your ownership? And that is done with blockchain technology which itself warrants a whole other talk. But for simplicity's sake, let's try and simplify the blockchain down into a sort of accounting ledger or a massive Excel documents that records all transactions that can be read and recorded by anyone. So to go back to your purchase, what occurs is once you've made that purchase and made the exchange, the receipts are then taken up by a miner, which is actually a computer, that then collect your receipt and a bunch of other receipts and puts them down in a notebook or a block. Once that notebook is fill up, full up, the miner will then show this notebook to other computers to confirm that everything is correct. And then once that is accepted, it's added to the blockchain forever. So your information of your ownership is now established on the blockchain and it's there to prove that you own this piece but you might be asking um hold up where's my nft right i've got something to confess um so yeah your nft isn't typically stored on the blockchain itself it's too big it's usually stored somewhere else like a dedicated server or a peer-to-peer -peer network not too dissimilar to the way you get your files from pirate bay this isn't me advocating piracy. So yeah, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. What you did get from your transaction is a receipt and that contains data that then helps you to locate where your NFT is being stored. Do you remember that vending machine from earlier? It's still got a part to play in the story. So the vending machine is actually a piece of code called a smart contract. You can talk to that smart contract to ask it things about the thing that you own. For example, where is this artwork stored? Who owns it? And it will then tell you like this sort of information. So um, this is perhaps the most technical aspect of my th talk thus far and like the only one I promise. But there was an NFT I found over here and there were details about it on the listing page. So the bit where it says contract address, that's the vending machine that I was talking about. I then needed to take the tokens ID, which is three, then input it on a website called Etherscan that listed this vending machine. And it gave me a response saying that this at this URL, you will find the metadata about this piece. So checking out the metadata, I then see that the image itself is actually stored on a place called IPFS, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network. And if you enter that address correctly, then you get the NFT. Um, and yeah, I don't know about you, but I don't happen to have like $5,000 just laying around to like, just get this NFT. So yeah, there is nothing stopping you from just copying and pasting that stuff. But what you don't have is proof of ownership, which is the NFT, which is where people are getting all hyped about the value and dropping big money on things. So uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. And I hope this might have cleared up the confusion about things a little bit. There is just so much in this space that I've glossed over in this talk. But if you'd like to connect and like maybe chat crypto stuff, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm also compiling a resources list of things that I found handy to help my understanding as a developer working in the blockchain space. And also, can I do a special shout out, because I see you're in the crowd, to Law, who uh, recently invited me on her podcast, Craft and Culture, to talk about Web3, crypto, NFT stuff. Um, and it's only 27 minutes long. It was a really funny chat, so I'd recommend you check it out if you want to know anything else about what I've talked about. And I guess my final words on this is, um, yeah, crypto 
technology is wild, okay? So do your research before you ever part with any money. There are a lot of scams as much as innovations within this space. So take personal responsibility. Never ever share your crypto wallet's private keys, okay? That's all I have to say. So uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Can everyone unmute and actually give her a round of applause? Yeah, because oh, no. I was really nervous <laughs> Okay. I'm gonna need you to go back and look at the chat after this because you were that was before. so divine. Jesus, I'm sorry for taking the Lord's name in vain. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, guys. It's so kind. Thank you. So the chat wants to know when is your YouTube channel or podcast starting? I wonder who asked that question. No, oh, you people you? want to know. No, is that you? Oh, that's so kind. Thank you so much for like that sort of feedback. I through this, I've discovered that I actually quite like the education -y side of things. So Amber, I might actually take your lead and do a little bit of educating myself. But there's no plan through YouTube just yet. But just yeah. If you want to do some educating, I know this group called Cody Black Females who might want to, you know. Maybe. Have maybe. You on board, <laughs> you know? maybe now that would be cool. That'd be cool. That would be amazing. And by the way, we're getting some comments in the YouTube chat as well. Jeez. Okay. So, we get it. so everyone afterwards in the replay crew, check out the YouTube chat as well. <laughs> nice, nice. Does anyone have any questions as well as love for Elle? Uh, please, nothing too technical. I like literally just copied all this from Wikipedia. I have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. Bring them on. Bring them on. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I promise not technical at all. Uh, <laughs> so my question is, um, how did your journey into blockchain, um, you know, Bitcoin and all of that, NFTs, how, do, how did your journey start? Uh, okay, let's try and do this real small. Um, I came into this space by actually attending um, an accelerator event. There was like free booze, free food. It was Japanese themed. And that's how I got into crypto because I actually won a prize that night. And then I saw on Coding Black Females, they were advertising, uh, this is why you should definitely join. They were advertising scholarships for the Consensus Blockchain Developer course. I thought, okay, I've got this crypto. Maybe I should learn a little bit more about it. I took the course and that's how I come to you now. So um, yeah, just if, there's, if this course comes up, definitely do it. I recommend it 100%. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Did everyone get a screenshot of how to keep in touch with Elle, by the way? Because I took one and I can share it with everyone so you can get them QR codes. But did anyone else get it as well? Please, please share. I didn't but get I'll it. I'll share it afterwards. If that's okay with you, Elle? Yeah, sure. Yeah? Amazing. Great. Finally tonight, we have got a wonderful young lady who's not feeling well today. So please, please give her some love. Make her make it worthwhile well that she stayed up late and she's not feeling well to come and share some knowledge with us. Jesse, are you ready? As ready as I can be. Apologies in advance, everyone, if my um my voice is super raspy. Um yeah, hopefully, hopefully this talk will be somewhat enjoyable and interesting, despite my it's despite be my how I'm feeling inside. <laughs> it's gonna be amazing. Uh, You're gonna be amazing. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And in ten minutes' time, you can go back to sleep. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, thanks. Um, so today, I want to talk to you about why OWASP is the key to being a great software engineer. I think it's a massively underutilized resource. And it's often kind of dismissed as something that's too complicated and it scares a lot of especially juniors um, from wanting more about it. And I'd like to tell you why that shouldn't be the case. My, my screen wants to. Cool. So a bit of an intro to me. Um, I'm a software engineer at CyberSafe, which is a, a cybersecurity startup. And we're all about empowering people to become more secure online and do that through leveraging behavioral science and um, yeah, behavioral interventions that would allow you to be more secure online. So it's kind of 
cybersecurity and being able to kind of spot risks and find ways to um, mitigate those risks is something that's really important to me and something that I've become increasingly interested in as I've become more and more uh, like involved in this field. And I definitely think that the more we've kind of been um, reliant on technology and the more that we're seeing all of the exploitation that's happening, especially with current events at the moment, it's more important now than ever that people who are building the software that we're putting all of our data onto are aware of the ways that they can build it in a safe and secure way. Um, so the this quote is, I think, really emblematic of why it's so important to care about security. And so it's the the OWASP global board member who said perhaps the, the problem of insecure software is perhaps the most important technical challenge of our time. And I just want to start the presentation with this because I believe that it's important that we understand that there's no single strategy that will guarantee success. The point of security is to slow the attackers down. You're never going to have a 100% secure application or website, but it's really important that we implement strategies that make it more difficult to compromise those systems. And then a little bit of an intro to OWASP. So OWASP is an open and collaborative, oh, it doesn't end this quote, but open and collaborative knowledge. So um, yeah, it's, it's nothing is bulletproof, but it's really important that we implement the strategies that make it more difficult, as I said. Uh, that is the OWASP way to be open and collaborative. So what is OWASP? It stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. Essentially, it gives absolutely anybody the ability to understand the techniques used to test for common security issues. So it's created by a collective of engineers and experts in cybersecurity, and they've come together because they believe that cybersecurity should not be a black art or a closed secret that only a select few can understand. It should be open to absolutely everybody and not exclusive to security practitioners, but also QA engineers, developers, um, and anybody who's interested in building technology. So the project is um, aims to build a guide that keeps the expertise in the hands of the people who need it. So that's you, that's me, and that's anybody involved in building technology. So everything is absolutely free that they produce and the learning resources are catered to all levels. So even if you think you're a newbie and you don't know too much about building technology yet, um, uh, OWASP is definitely still accessible to everybody. So you, what you may have heard the most about in terms of OWASP is the OWASP top 10. And this is a standard security document for developers and web application um, security. So it represents a broad consensus about what the most critical security risks to a web application are. Um, and it's globally recognized by developers as the first step towards more secure coding. So there are, not there are absolutely not enough application security experts in the world to make any significant dent to the overall problem. And so the initial responsibility for application security has to fall on the people that write the code. So us, the software devs, Yes, even the front end ones. <laughs> I see you, Amber. <laughs> um, so and now I want to talk a little bit more about how they figure out what deserves to be in the top 10. So they the top 10 is ranked on three things, the exploitability, detectability and technical impact of if that thing is going to be exploited. Um, keeping this information up to date is critical to making sure that the guide is effective and so by adopting the wiki approach which means that it's open source and refreshed regularly it means that the OWASP community can evolve and expand the information in the guide and keep up to date with the fast moving application security threat landscape so it's all about releasing quickly and uh, pulse is typically once every three years to try and balance the speed of change which attackers are using to exploit things that are going on. Um, yes, so the key is that it provides actionable information which you can benchmark your code with. So it's a broad consensus about most critical um, security risks to a web application. And you can kind of use it like a checklist um, to check against your code base or whatever you're adding to the code base or whatever you're building to make sure that you're covering those top 10 risks. 
So a lot of organizations incorporate the report into their processes. And I'm going to talk about a couple of reasons why that might be the case. So it, like I mentioned before, it helps to make your application more armored against cybersecurity attacks. It's an expert source checklist. So even though you're not an expert in cybersecurity or you have no kind of deep, broad understanding of all of the different risks. If you're using this as a guide, as a checklist, you're most likely going to cover the things that would make you most vulnerable to attack. So it's a really good way to start. Because it is giving you the priority of risks to focus on, you've kind of, you've got the expert guidance you, that you can use to understand, identify, mitigate and fix, because otherwise the security aspect of your project can be really, really overwhelming. How on earth do you start? Um, this is a really good place to, to figure that out. And how does it make you a better developer? So software testers and QA can use the guide to expand a set of test cases that they apply. Um, Amber knows how much I love testing, but this is something that I use um, to think about the test cases I've not considered if I'm working on something like authentication and catching these vulnerabilities early can save a lot of, consider uh, can save a lot of time late and effort later. So um, you're less likely to come up with those against those issues post-production and when you've released your work. Um, yeah, so again, it, how does it make you a better developer? You will catch those vulnerabilities earlier. And how does it, the final reason for how it makes you a better developer is you'll, be, you'll build secure code by default. At first, these 10 or however many you want to look into might seem a little bit overwhelming there's a little bit of kind of understanding that you might want to go into to kind of know exactly why those threats exist and how to mitigate them but over time you will come to develop secure code by default and that will make you an extremely valuable person um, in terms of being able to keep up with the pace of the the ever-evolving threats that are in are in web development and software development at the moment So in order to build secure web applications, follow the OWASP and that will help you become an incredible engineer. Um, I strongly encourage you to get familiar with the security testing guidance uh, because it's a great roadmap for testing and you get to come across a lot of the common issues that are facing applications today. So if you have any questions about how you might go about this or ways to start looking into this because it can seem a little bit daunting, um, something that i'm not sure if the applications will open today or tomorrow but something very exciting is that cybersafe will be doing a course with coding black females to do an introduction to cyber security and secure pro pra practices um, and that will be from the cybersafe engineering team where we'll be going through some of these um, yeah and that's that's everything for me thanks so much for listening and we get a virtual round of applause for Jesse, please. That was amazing. So someone already put a question in the chat and you answered it. it was do you recommend any courses to learn more on this? And nicely done it, you recommended your own course. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> like females are gonna be the gigs, but um yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's a good one. Elle has a question. Elle, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question? Hi, yeah, so I do front-end development and I probably should be a lot better at cybersecurity. So thank you so much for your talk for like reminding me it's quite important. I am the first line of defense. Um, my question is, what's your favorite sort of vulnerability on the like on a website? Mine is when you write something in a textbook and you end up dropping or deleting someone's whole database. So do you have a favorite uh, vulnerability? Yeah, there's a good meme about that. I was that I've wanted to put that in the presentation with the drop Timmy drop table. If you that like one, if you, that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Um a favorite vulnerability. I think like the log4j one was kind of like mad. So being at log forging is um, and we spoke about this in the in Danny's course this week, which was um basically a log is something that you can we how you keep track of actions and what people are doing and if you're able to kind of exploit that log forging and and put in a log that isn't actually very true you can 
do a lot of damage to a lot of computers. And so an open source tool, the log4j thing, um, a lot of people discovered that and kind of all hell broke loose on a weekend um, and kind of, yeah, took the internet down. So that, that one was, yeah, pretty crazy that it was so, uh, what's the word, where it's just everywhere. Prevalent. Yeah. Oh, sorry, prevalent. Yeah, that's a good one. Prevalent. Yeah. We have another question. Are OWASP always new recommendations every year or are there some repeat offenders? It's a really good question. So the top 10 doesn't tend to change that much. It's it gets updated every three years, roughly. Um, but this time, so the 2021 list has changed quite a lot and things have swapped positions, but it tends not to be that there's like completely new concepts. Um, it's just that the, so like, I think log forging is, might be number one this year because of all the things that happened with that. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, with the order, but I don't think it's that important necessarily to stay on top of what number things are, but more just like be aware of those top 10, yeah. Jesse, correct me if I'm wrong. Was this your very first technical, technical talk? Yes. <laughs> and you're not feeling well as well? Ah, <laughs> love it. Thank you, Daniel. A few people in the chat are asking you to do a talk on your journey into tech. So maybe we can do something around that as well, because everyone mm -hmm. wants to know how you got into it. <laughs> No, that's really interesting and actually me and Amber just did a spaces about this on Monday um yeah but I'd, I'd, yeah it'd be really cool to, to do it all about as well before we wrap up tonight's amazing set of talks are there any more questions for any of the speakers It might be quicker to unmute than to type in the chat. Hint, 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 hint. No questions, but um, just really appreciated how you broke it down. Like everyone always talks about the OWASP top 10 as being like this standard and um, it just been talked about for so long. And I was just like, I can't ask. Like I can't, I can't ask it's in too deep. <laughs> so I really appreciate you breaking it down for us. And, and yeah. Do you know what the thing is? Like people love to gatekeep information and make it seem way more difficult than it is. And I think that's happened with OWASP. And like, I like, I don't think, I don't know how many engine. Like I know that my team were not very aware of them either. And I just wonder how many people kind of are too scared to look into it because it seems so intimidating. So yeah, I, I fully get that. I fully get that. realize the time it is 7 54 so we are at the end of tonight's festivities this has been amazing i've been looking forward to as soon as i saw um what everyone's going to talk about i was like i was supposed to be off work this week and i was like no no i'll be hosting this event tonight i have to be there this has been incredible i'm really hoping How can we that, keep in um... touch with everyone to shout out your um your social handles so we can keep in touch with you all and tag you into things tonight. Send in love. Jesse, do you wanna go first? Um, I was just gonna say, I really hope that we have more first time speakers next at the next one, because it's a really nice way to kind of have an intro to doing a technical talk. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having us. Jesse, where can we find you on the internet? Jesse Bell on Twitter and Jesse August on LinkedIn. I'll put them in the chat. Amber, where can we find you on the internet? Um, Amber Shand on LinkedIn. AmberShand.co.uk is my blog. Amber Lee Tech, <laughs> my Twitter. And Kotel Journey, which is my Instagram. Danny, where can we find you on the internet? Nowhere. I've scrubbed it all. Good. Um, I like that. I like yeah, that. I like that answer. Um, well, we can play the drum machine, right? Do you want to plug that? Oh, again? did wait? Did, did I send that just to you, or did I send that to everyone? I think you sent it just to me, but I put it in the chat. <laughs> cool. Um, Danny Uzel on LinkedIn and um, at Uzel on 
Twitter. I'll just put that in now. And there's, yeah, sweet. And L, where can we find you on the internet? Okay, uh, I think you can find me on LinkedIn uh, at Dapperlass. It's um, my name on there is a nerd joke that I don't have the time to explain, but like, yeah, find me on there. I should really improve my online and presence so I can, can connect with more of you, but I'm as part of Coding Black Females, so just say hi. Amazing. And don't forget, we're going to be doing these lightning talks again. I found out the date is June 1st. So applications will open maybe mid-April, beginning of May. So hopefully you've all been inspired and you have ideas for talks. We'd love to have more people doing talks. Or if you want them sooner, maybe start bombarding us on social media and be like, we want more lightning talks. Everyone was amazing tonight. I'm inspired. I want to give a talk now. I've been Tanya Powell. I've been your host for the evening. Don't forget to follow us on social everywhere. We are Coding Black Females. Apart from on Twitter, we're Coding Black Femmes. We've got a special announcement coming out in the next couple of weeks. Be sure to keep an eye on that. We're very, very excited. We have a bunch of courses, a bunch of events coming up as well. Keep an eye on us everywhere. And it's our birthday today as well. Happy fifth birthday, Coding Black Females. Five years old. Happy fifth birthday. Happy fifth birthday. Happy fifth. Happy fifth. And I'm going to let you all go. <gasps> Enjoy the rest of your days. See you later. Bye. Bye.